Hello everyone and welcome to Northern Kentucky Sports Legends. I'm Charlie Coleman and as always I'm joined by Joe Brennan of the Northern Kentucky Sports Hall of Fame. Thank you, thank you Charlie. Uh, Paul Sparling has been a Cincinnati Bengal trainer for over 30 years. Uh, he was inducted into our Hall of Fame in December 23. He's our guest today. Uh, Paul, welcome. Well, thanks and for having me. We would like to start, uh, if you could tell a little bit about your history. You actually started uh, with the Bengals in Wilmington, Ohio. But where were you born and raised and your family? Yeah, I was born in Amarillo, Texas and uh, moved uh, when I was four or five years old up to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base right outside of Dayton, Ohio. My father was a, a uh, ultimately a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force and uh, grew up in that area and then that's how I ended up going to Wilmington College because it was not far from uh, from where we were yeah. where we were growing up. And uh, I remember uh, we've been season tickets with my family since they started at Riverfront Stadium because my sister uh, Marion worked for their bagels when they hired them and uh, well, I've had tickets all through to their whole career and I remember going to Riverfront and that and we used to take the kids now they're all grown there in the 50s now but we remember taking them to Wilmington College up there is where the Bengals had their spring trainings and is that where you got your start with the well, Mike Brown? That's where I started with the club but uh, in terms of how I got into athletic training I was uh, in junior high school and uh, decided I wanted to go out, go out for sports and I looked around the, the school and I realized I was too small to play football, too short to play basketball and I already knew I couldn't hit a curveball. <laughs> so my options were limited. Uh, one of the coaches, Odell Percival, was a, a coach, teacher coach at uh, Man River Junior High School and uh, he asked me if I would be his uh, manager. I had actually gone out for the track team because I decided that was one sport I could probably do. Uh, but I ran around the track two or three times and I said, this is stupid, I'm running in circles. It doesn't make sense to me. So Odell Percival asked me if I would uh, be his manager. So I toted the stopwatches and the batons and all that kind of thing, kept the statistics and uh, <clears throat> did it just to occupy my time since I wasn't going to be an, the, the athlete that I had dreamt I might be. And um, one day he asked me if I was interested in going into athletic training. But you know, mind you now, athletic training back in those days, um, I'm dating myself, but uh, my impression was that it was an old guy with uh, khaki pants on and a white t-shirt, a uh, balding guy with uh, uh, a bucket of water in one hand and a black bag in the other hand and I I guess but make a long story short Mr. Percival took five dollars out of his wallet and sent it out to Kramer Products which was a, a company that still makes manufacturers athletic training products for athletes uh, for a home correspondence course and I took that home correspondence course and I fell in love with it I learned about how do you treat ankle sprains and, and hamstring strains and, and uh, abrasions and cuts and concussions and things like that. And that's where I fell in love with it and it just kind of blossomed from there. A lot of uh, analgesic and ankles tape. How many ankles do you think you Oh, I, I can't imagine. I mean, <laughs> tens of thousands, I do know that, although I will admit Later in my career, I started leaving that more to the uh, younger athletic trainers because the, the position changed so much with the team, it, it became more of an administrative position as you're managing workers' comp, injury grievances, uh, all the documentation, uh, the rehabilitation and things of that nature. Uh, we went from originally having a f one head athletic trainer, which was Marv Pollins, and myself as a part-time assistant to when I retired last year, uh, it was uh, eight full-time assistant athletic trainers plus four interns that work season long because the, the, the need, the demand, the expectations of the athletes continues to increase uh, as time has gone on. They still use analgesic and, and, and those type things? Not the way we used to. I mean, back in the day, it was Kramer Jesic or Mundy's Green Rub, yeah. Atomic Balm Atomic or Red Balm. Hot. Right. 
Um, they have their place, yeah. uh, but now it's the uh, it's the icy hot or the uh, yeah. Flexol 454. But it's not used near as much as it used to be. Whirlpools. We still have still whirlpools. Cool. They're they're a little bit fancier now. There's you know eight, ten, twelve person whirlpools. Wow. Uh, we actually had uh, we were the when we when uh, uh, Paul Brown Stadium, now Paycor Stadium was was built. Uh, one of the things that we put in there was an underwater treadmill, which was the first in the NFL. We were the first uh, team in the NFL to have the HydroWorks underwater treadmill, which we used for rehabilitation quite a mm -hmm. bit, cardiovascular fitness and things of that nature. So we still have them, uh, but they're not the, we don't use the old stainless steel tanks of, of uh, yesteryear. With dumping ice cubes in it. Absolutely. <laughs> that, those, yep. Nowadays it's all handled with refrigeration yeah. units and what have you. Yeah. Although for, uh, you know, during the, the hotter months, uh, we do set out uh, some of these uh, large water tanks with ice in it for the athletes to help them the cool down. The cold towels, put the towels? In yes. Still use those. Ice towels. Mike Brown hired you on a handshake and said, and I quote, I trust Paul Sparling. What's that mean to you? Well, it, it, it means volumes to me. Uh, it, it, uh, I will tell you this, the relationship that I have with Mike is, is second to none. Uh, I never was put in a position where I ever had to compromise my ethics or my morals. It was do what is right. And it was made very clear from day one that uh, I was to do what I thought was right and not allow anyone to pressure me to try to shortchange the process or, or, or do a player wrong. Uh, we were always looking not only for the short term, but more importantly for the long term health of the athlete. And I can tell you many stories where a player or a coach or somebody else might have wanted us to uh, uh, take the easy way out as it relates to uh, how to treat a particular injury which may have gotten the athlete back a little bit sooner, but their long-term outcome would have been worse. Uh, and Mike made it perfectly clear from the first day I got there that that's not how we do things. And I was never asked uh, to, to, to ever compromise, like I said. And, and I've, I've slept very, very well at night knowing that uh, we did things the right way. Paul Brown. Did you have a relationship with Paul Brown? I knew Paul Brown. He was yeah. still around when I first started back in 1978. Uh, he was no longer the head coach. He was the GM, and, and yeah. Tiger Johnson was the head coach when I started. Tiger followed Paul, right? That's correct. Yeah. And um, uh, he, when he walked into a room, you knew you were, you were in front of somebody special. Gravitas, mm -hmm. to say the least. And just to sit back and listen uh, hear the stories that he would relay to the other coaches and, and, and staff members and what have you, and his family with, with Mike and Pete. Um, I mean, I just, I marvel at the things that I was able to observe as a young kid history. fresh out of college. And he had got all that history. Oh my goodness. Especially uh, the NFL. The NFL, yeah. football, yeah. the things that he yeah. developed in football as yeah. far as the playbook. Uh, as Going far back as, to Miami University, probably. Absolutely, you know. and and the uh, he's the one that developed the face mask. Yeah, uh, he's the one that developed. He was the first one that developed the intercom system, to be able to communicate to the quarterback, mm -hmm. uh, electronically, and that was ultimately determined back in the day that you couldn't do that because it was cheating, and now mm -hmm. it's commonplace. Yeah. But uh, just the, the things that I was able to learn and observe and 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 have read about him. Uh, I just marvel at, uh, at, number one, the impact that he had on the sport, and number two, the fact that I was able to, to, to be around it and see it and, and uh, experience Did it. Did you get your picture with him anywhere? I probably do, but I can't tell you off the top of my yeah. head where it is. Yeah. Well, we're going to take our first break and uh, really some interesting things about the Cincinnati Bengals and your career, so stay tuned, Northern Kentucky. We'll be right back. Welcome back, Northern Kentucky, as we continue with former 
retired Bengal trainer Paul Sparling. And Joe, I'm going to kick it to you. And uh, we've got some uh, prompts here on the on the table that Paul has won, and uh, I know you want to highlight those. Yeah, Paul's had about a 32-year career with the Bengals, and with the, being the head trainer, and he's won a few awards during the years. And Paul, if you want to uh, go through and discuss them and tell us a story about how you got them and when. And well, I, I would just preface it with this: when you go into athletic training and sports medicine, you don't go in for the the potential awards yeah. or accolades. I mean, we're we're the behind the scenes folks. Uh, the less you see and hear from the athletic trainer, the better. Mm -hmm. uh, but that being said, it is certainly rewarding uh, when you are recognized for your efforts over the years. And this was an award that I, I earned in uh, 2020. Um, it's the uh, National Football League Physician Society Award, Fane Kane Memorial Award for the Outstanding NFL Athletic Trainer. Uh, it it uh, meant so much to me. It's an award that the physicians uh, vote upon, uh, the team physicians around the league, and uh, to have been selected for that was uh, absolutely the epitome of, of uh, an honor that uh, I will never forget. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Were you aware that they were giving that to you? Or was that uh, I was not aware. In fact, I, I had told my, I knew that I was up for it a couple of years prior. And uh, I told one of my assistants, Dan Willen, a good friend of mine, I said, if I am ever selected for this, I, you need to tell me because I don't want to be surprised. Uh, and he did not tell me. And uh, my family was there. It was presented at the NFL Combine meeting uh, in Indianapolis. And I had no idea yeah. that I was going to be the one picked. So it just it was, uh, again, just incredible, incredibly exciting and, and humbling as well. Now this one here goes back to your early days. Yeah, I was uh, fortunate enough to have been inducted into the Wilmington College uh, Athletic Hall of Fame, where that's where I did my undergraduate work and studies. Um, was one of the first athletic trainers that graduated from their program as they were just starting in its infancy. And uh, again, to have been selected uh, and, and voted in on that, just it, it just, it, makes me speechless just mm -hmm. to to rec to see it, that people have recognized you know what you've done yeah. and and the things that you've done to try to promote not only not only the school in this case the Wilmington College but also the profession of athletic training right and yeah, well and from your hometown and that that means a lot too oh it means a great yeah. deal Wilmington Quakers Wilmington College Quakers the yeah. oxymoron is the fighting Quakers but, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and this here was a well, it all started at Stebbins High School, and that's where uh, I was a nine-letter winner at Stebbins High School, football, basketball, and track, all for athletic trainer. It was a student athletic trainer. They didn't even have a, a trainer then. I was a student, and the, uh, the athletic director found out that I was interested in, in helping out, and they actually sent me to a couple of uh, Kramer Products workshops, one at Ohio State, one at Miami of Ohio, um, and they gave me a key to the room that they called the training room. There was actually a whirlpool in there, and, and that's where I, I helped the coaches out, but I really kind of honed my skills, if you will, but really piqued my interest. Yeah. And I knew when I was getting ready to graduate from high school that one thing that I wanted to do was, was to go into college. That was, that was kind of unlike a lot of kids that graduate from high school. They're not sure what they want to be when they grow up. I knew what I wanted to be when I grew up, and amazingly I was given the opportunity and I took advantage of it yeah but that's where you got your start that's where I got my start was at Stevens yeah. High School and this other one is a uh, Hall of Fame Ohio Athletic yeah, Trainers. Yeah the, uh, <clears throat> the Ohio Athletic Trainers Association uh, has a Hall of Fame and uh, I've been up for this for many many years and I kind of felt like uh, Ken Anderson never quite getting the call yeah for the hall, and uh, it was the day before we were playing uh, in the Super Bowl uh, in LA against the Rams, and uh, I was out on the practice field, and I got a call from Gary Lake, the uh, pr the uh, Hall of Fame uh, chairman of the committee for the Ohio Athletic Trainers Association, and he called me uh, to inform me on my cell phone that I had been selected. And again, another honor that I just, 
I, I am humbled by it, and it just means so much to know that all those years of, of hard work and, and countless hours and, uh, you know, you just, you, you give so much of yourself and to have people recognize what you've done uh, is quite an honor. Yeah. Paul, I'm, I'm going to ask a couple questions that uh, I think our viewers would like to okay. know the answer to. Give us your typical day, in season and out, as far as how many hours, what time do you get to the stadium and what time do you leave? And, well, during the season, um, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday are the longest days. Wednesday, we would get there by 6.30 because we'd start with a doctor's clinic at 7. Uh, that would run until 8. And then players are going into meetings, uh, doing a walkthrough before lunch. Then they would have uh, lunch and then we'd do more treatments on them. They'd have more meetings and we'd go to practice. And then, uh, I mean, it would be basically from 6.30 until 6.30. Uh, seven days a week. Uh, Mondays would be a little bit shorter. Tuesdays were the players off day, but that doesn't mean the staff are off. We're still there taking care of the injured players. And Do they come in? They would you know, still. I mean, if they would, that they need treatment, they're yep. expected to be there. They're expected to be there. Mm -hmm. And uh, Fridays are a little bit shorter days. Saturdays are uh, a walkthrough either before a home game or you're getting ready to travel. Uh, but it's seven days a week for six months, which is grueling. Yeah. Uh, and then the off season, when I first started, the off season would start, you know, second, second or third week after the season was over, <laughs> and then you wouldn't worry about coming back in until probably March, get ready for the draft. Well, nowadays there's no such thing as an off season. We call it the playing season and the non-playing season, mm -hmm. because you've got free agency, you've got. Uh, Are they bringing those eight? free agent guys in for uh, bring them in for physical drills and so on not so much drills but you're doing a lot of research on the the okay. physical health of the player okay. uh, and there's also um, uh, they're bringing the players in to try to recruit them because the players have the choice to go wherever they want do they time them do uh, strength testing anything no, no? At, at that stage once yeah. you've already yeah. proven yourself as an NFL player it's okay. rare that you'd have to work out okay unless you're brought in and at you know later in the year and there's three or four players and they're trying to pick from some but okay. when you're looking for the uh, the big money free agents uh, they're not going to work out they've already put their their uh, paid work their on dues, right? they've paid their dues and put their work on tape and, and yeah. you know what they've what they can do and what they've done um, but again between the draft training camp mini camps free agency off season surgeries uh, rehabilitations and things of that nature. It's a it's a 12 month a year, a job, and it mm -hmm. it is grueling, and that's why not as many as used to be are able to last. I mean, I I I was a head athletic trainer for 30 years with the team for 44. I was able to retire on my own. Only about 20 percent of the athletic trainers in the National Football League retire on their own, yeah. Yeah. and 80 percent are are moved on because of a new head coach, new general manager, new owner, or they just they decide they want to make a change, and I was fortunate. How many coaches did you work under? Eight head coaches. Eight head coaches. I think we're uh, getting a signal for another break, but uh, we'll be right back, and uh, stay tuned for a very <coughs> interesting interview. Welcome back, Northern Kentucky, as we continue with Paul Sparling and some great stories about his career as a trainer with the Bengals, but uh, also some interesting facts. And Joe, I'm going to kick it to you. Yeah, Paul, we'd also like to get on record that uh, for 30 years and all the hours of work you put in, you also had a family and raised children. And uh, in fact, a couple of your children went to Holy Cross High School right here behind us and Covington and uh, Latonia, and uh, would you like to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, I have an older daughter, Ashley, who's 33, and uh, I'll tell you one real quick story about her. When we won the AFC championship game in Kansas City, 
I got on the phone on the field and was uh, reached out to uh, uh, my wife and two children that were here in northern Kentucky. Ashley is in Philadelphia and uh, she had tears and snot coming down. We were <laughs> FaceTiming. Yeah. She was so excited and she said, Daddy, do you remember you told me when I was younger that if the Bengals ever went to the Super Bowl again, I'd get to go. And I was like, doggone it, she remembered that. <laughs> and I said yes, and she asked if we'd get to go, and I told her absolutely she'd get to go. So that was kind of fun, because yeah. during her growing up, the Bengals were not a very good team, if you may recall. I've got two other children, uh, Kenneth and Natalie, uh, that we adopted from Russia when they were infants. And interestingly, we were given the opportunity to travel to Russia during the football season for the, the adoption process, and Mike Brown was fully aware of what we were doing. And they gave us the invitation, and it just happened to be uh, during the bye week. And I went to Mike, and I said, Mike, I said, we've give, been given the, the invitation to come over to, to, uh, to meet the children and start the adoption process, but it's during the bye week. If you want me to wait till the season's over, I understand completely. And he looked at me, didn't hesitate, and said, go, those kids need you. And uh, they have grown into some really wonderful uh, young man and woman. Uh, did go to Holy Cross High School and, and uh, think the world of them. But they, they definitely kept me on my toes. And I will tell you when they say, when they told me that having kids at my age back then would make me feel younger, they lied because <laughs> they wore me out. But yeah. they got to grow up when uh, Marvin Lewis came. So yeah. they got to see the transformation yeah. of the Bengals. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's part of their identity. It's been yeah. really neat about that. I, I was looking, he, he had a winning record, Marvin did yes. in his career by a few games. I was just looking at that. And he had recently. a lot to turn around. Yeah, yes, he, yes he did, there were some lean years. There were some very, very lean years that uh, I tell people that's yeah. where all my gray hair came from. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask you about different coaches and I told you off camera, who my favorite Bengal coach was, but it was Forrest Gregg. But some of your favorite coaches, is that a fair question? Sure. I mean, Forrest yeah. was a, a legend, as you well yeah. know. I mean, yeah. he, he came in. Vince Lombardi guy. He yeah, he yeah. came in old school. And uh, I tell you what, he made it easy on the athletic training staff because he could clump, he could walk into the training room and guys would be laying on the tables and they'd all migrate up and go out to the practice field because it's he was like would, Oral Roberts laid a hand on the same <laughs> thing. They, they he got he, better in a he made doggone sure the guys knew that if they could walk, they could go out to practice. They were going to be out there. Uh, Dick LeBeau, wonderful person, just great personality and as sincere as they come. Uh, Homer Rice was a wonderful young, yeah. wonderful man. I mean, yeah. just a wonderful coach. Just it, it, at that time, we needed to have a stern disciplinarian, and that's when Paul and Mike Brown brought in Forrest Gregg, and yeah. he clearly was the uh, the opposite of of Homer. Yeah. Um, loved working with Marvin Lewis. Uh, he came in and, and really helped turn things around and, and set a whole new. It's kind of set things in a whole new direction, which was certainly needed. Um, Bruce Coslett, I enjoyed working with him. Uh, I remembered him when he was a player. And uh, Dave Shula, I, li I liked working with Dave, but things just didn't work he out. He was young. Like, he was he, very, he, very young. He had players older than him. He had yeah. players older than him, yeah. coaches older than him, and he was in a tough spot. Yeah. And it just unfortunately didn't work yeah. out for him. And, and then Zach has obviously brought in a whole new level of excitement and enthusiasm, and and uh, with the with the quarterback that we've got now, uh, the sky's the limit if you can keep him vertical. Yeah, keep him healthy. Uh, we're getting short on time, but favorite player that you enjoyed working with? You know, I, I I loved working with most of them, and as I'm retired now, people ask me, do I miss it? I don't miss the long hours. I don't miss the West Coast trips and getting in at three and four o'clock in the morning. Yeah. What I miss is the relationships, the, 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 the players, uh, just getting to know them and their <laughs> families. Uh, certainly Anthony Munoz comes to mind. Bruce Kozerski comes to mind. Uh, I, I could list, no matter how many I list, there'd be somebody that I'd forget. Absolutely. But mm -hmm. good people and, and understanding that they are people first uh, and not just treat them as a player. 
Yeah. And I, I always I always enjoyed getting to know them as people and, and being there not just for uh, to take care of their injuries, but if they had questions about life in general, because again, a lot of these are young kids coming mm -hmm. in fresh out of uh, school and they're away from home and they're just looking for uh, a listening ear sometimes. Yeah, one other thing I'd like to touch base on is, is all the physical work you do as a trainer and everything. Could you just give us a brief uh, resume of what you put in the Bengals practice and that, that resulted in the Buffalo game last year saving the football player's life. What thought processes and what went into that, they have all that prepared. So when something like that happened, they were ready to respond. Yeah, I will tell you, I mean, athletic training is, is the prevention and care of athletic injuries. And part of that is emergency medicine. And uh, we have to plan for the unexpected. We have to plan for the, uh, the unfortunate. And, and fortunately, it rarely is ever needed. But it's, you've got a, a myriad of, of people behind you that are there, uh, paramedics, physicians, uh, uh, airway physicians, uh, emergency medical technicians, people that are there in the event of a tragedy that does and can occur. Uh, as you know, the Buffalo incident that occurred last year was the first time anyone has ever gone into cardiac arrest on a National Football League field. And uh, I was fortunate enough to have associated myself with really good, intelligent, smart people. We had uh, a, an affiliation with the University of Cincinnati Medical Center. All of the physicians that we had on standby uh, were affiliated or affiliated with them. And uh, they did a phenomenal job of, of giving that kid a second chance. I mean, that was all prepared, though. Like, before the game starts, it's, so you go over and check everything. If this happens, we're going to do X, Y, Z. There's a game plan that's put together. Just like the coaches have a game plan for how the game's going to go, right. we have contingency plans or emergency action plans. In the event this happens, that happens, we rehearse those. Uh, on an annual basis, multiple times throughout the year, mm -hmm. on site at the stadium, so that to try to make everything as as uh, seamless as possible, so that you're not running around trying to question what do we do. Yeah. The plan was in place; it had been in place for many, many, many years, and it was the first time we truly had to implement it. And uh, could not have been more pleased or proud to see how well everyone performed. Well, thank you, Paul, and uh, unfortunately time has run out, but uh, Northern Kentucky, I hope you've enjoyed this interview with Paul Sparling, and thank you for coming down and to Northern Kentucky, another Northern Kentucky legend. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for watching. Yeah, thank you, Paul. My pleasure. Right. <laughs> thank you. Excellent.